worship the Lord today. Yeah. Worship team, are we excited to worship the Lord today? Hallelujah. We're so grateful to be with you in the house of the Lord and in the presence of the Lord today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord, for another day. Thank you for the breath in our lungs. We thank you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for your presence. We thank you that we are a new creation in you, Jesus. your joy be our strength. In your mighty and holy name, Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. All right, church, we're going to get excited this morning.
City Church, if you are not awake after that song, we are going to pray that you come back to life in Jesus' name. Uh, welcome. Thank you for being with us this Sunday. Children, you may be dismissed to uh, your left, to my right, which you probably can't see me. That's okay. Um, just head out there. You'll see some children's workers. Bye, baby. I love you. Um, have a great time at Kids Church. Bye, bud. I love you. You're awesome. Uh, yeah, you got your king's hat ready to go. Okay, awesome. Awesome. Well, we got a couple quick announcements, and then we're going to um, dive right back into worship. Um, this upcoming Tuesday, we are starting our new, um, our new midweek study. Um, I believe it's on the Jesus. It's on Jesus. So that's going to be awesome. And then uh, we have youth. Um, we have uh, uh, Jesus' last words, I think is what it is. Thanks, Mike. Um, yes, uh, I knew it had something to do with Jesus. But, uh, <laughs> and then we have youth Tuesdays, 6.30 to 8 p.m. Uh, and then kids club as well. Everything you need Tuesday nights. And then also... We have, uh, if this is your first time with us, on the back of the chair is a connect card. Go ahead and scan that. Get some information. We'd like to hang out with you, grab some coffee and or lunch. Um, your treat. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I'm totally kidding. Um, but no, we, 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 we want to hang out with you guys, get to know you a little more, and uh, journey through life with you. With that being said, um, let's pray. Father, I thank you for who you are. Lord, that your presence is in this place. Lord, we, we thank you for the outpouring of your presence that's happening right now in our country. Lord, and that's the echo of our heart, God, that we would be in step with you wherever you're moving, God. We want to be in step with you. Lord, I pray for California. God, that revival would hit California. Lord, so many people are, are down in California and making fun of California, but we know that, that as California goes, this nation goes, and as this nation goes, the world goes. And so, Lord, I pray, God, that your people would put such a demand on your presence, so oh God, that you would have no choice but to come down in power. Lord, we love you so much. Have your way this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.
you're here let our worship be your throne amazed by who you are your presence makes us
fresh pour out your spirit on us on your sons and daughters 
Oh, how we love you, faithful Father. And we need you now. We cry out for an open heaven. Oh, for the presence of heaven. Let your kingdom come. Let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Let the heavens open. Let your kingdom move. All our faith and hope in our great God. Let the heavens open. Let your kingdom your prayer. Let your Holy Spirit fall on us. God, we want you, Lord. We don't want to just come and, and play church. God, we want you to shake us to the very core of who we are today, Lord. I, I pray that over life. Shake people to the very core of who they are today. I, I know that that's what you want through this word, that you would shake people. So God, I ask you to do that in the name of Jesus. Jesus. You can be seated. Good morning. Good morning, everybody. And I, I want to um, kind of just transition to the word because I feel the word is going to set us up for a second half of worship today. And I'm going to set some context and it's going um, to be important for us. So you can turn to James chapter 4. And it is great to be back um, from Japan and visiting my son. And he is doing great. He is working hard in the ER there, in the Naval Hospital. And it's crazy to um, have him leave a boy and go see him a man. And he is a man's man. I look at him like, that came from us? No way, right? 
Japan is really cool. There's sushi, right? Great sushi. Um, great people, rich culture. And so um, I, when I was on my way, I, I left here Sunday night. So it'd be two weeks ago today. And my flight left at midnight. And I slept for a couple hours on the flight. And then I woke up somewhere over the Pacific Ocean between here and and Japan, and um, I, I brought my stuff because I wanted to start working on my series. And when I woke up, um, God gave me a word for you today, and it came off of that that sermon I preached that morning. And sometimes this will happen to me. And so um, I I got this word, and it was very clear to me, and I felt like it was going to be really important to you today. And so I put my plans on hold for sure. How many of you know that's a good thing to do when the Lord speaks to you and when the Holy Spirit guides you? I put my plans on, on hold. I'll start the series next, next week, the Lord willing, a two-part series on money. Um, but the last message I preached two weeks ago was my last, my last message on the altar, the altar series. And I made this statement towards the end of the message. And it's really what I woke up to somewhere over the Pacific Ocean. Um, and it's this. Humility is the gateway to grace. Humility is the great gateway to grace. I think this is really, really important for us to get a hold of today, okay? Humility, everyone say humility, is the gateway to grace in your, in your life. It's the gateway to grace. I want you to do me a favor today, okay? Um, I want you to do me this favor. Be open to God doing whatever he wants in your life today. Can I, can I get that favor from you, okay? Because I, I've, I know that God gave me this sermon, but I don't know exactly what he wants to do in your life. And I think it's because he wants to do some different things in all of your lives today. So, so the, the deal is I'm going to bring it, um, and then you are going to allow God to do whatever he wants in your life. If that's a deal, will you say amen today, okay? You're going to let him do whatever he wants. You're going to let the walls be broken down and let God really move in you today. You know, it's been a really cool, I'd say 10 days, 11 days now for our, our country. Um, we've seen an incredible revival breakout at Asbury University. Have you guys saw, seen that? It's, it's amazing to, to watch. And um, I've been following it. I was, of course, I was in Japan when it happened on uh, Tuesday. And when it was about two hours old, I started seeing some activity and some uh, messages and some, some updates on it. I started following it from about two hours. So if you don't know what happened, they had a normal chapel service, and they started the altar time, and God just showed up, and the altar time is still going today. Ten days later, it's still going, and there's thousands of people that have made their way. How many of you know our country needs a revival? Amen. How many of you know? How many of you know? Do you know what? How many of you know our kids need a revival and our teenagers need a revival and our young people, our campuses? Do you know what I was thinking this week? I was like, God, bring me revival, bring revival. Like, and I'm like, God, I've experienced moves of God like this in my life. If I don't experience it ever again, that's fine. I want my kids to get it. I want my teenagers to get it. I want my young adult to get it. I want our kids to experience God in a way we never could. Our country needs it. Yeah. And we've seen this happen. In, in Asbury, and it's so cool, and I've been following it, and, um, and I've been reading a lot of testimonies from it, and I keep hearing the same thing from people that were there when it started. Um, how did this start? It started through humility. There was a moment of incredible humility and repentance that happened at that, that college. Humility, that word, remember, I, I already had this message that God had given me, that word humility, I keep seeing it. Matter of fact, this morning, I was reading a testimony from someone that is there and was there when it started. And she used the word, it started because of radical humility. Everyone say radical humility. Radical humility happened in that, in that place. I, I want you to hear me today. Any move of God begins out of a spirit of humility. I would say, venture to say radical humility. Any move of God in your life, in your family, in your marriage, in a church, corporately, personally, starts with a spirit of humility. You could, you could flip the, the script the other way, too. The other way, the biggest enemy to a move of God, corporate or personal, is pride. The biggest, it's, it's like a dam, okay? That the, the goodness of God, the grace of God, the presence of God wants to flow to you. And pride stops it dead in its tracks. Any move of God has to be 
brought in by a spirit of humility. And it's not just a spiritual matter. We're going to talk about it spiritually here um, for, for a while, but it also has to do with your marriage. I, I, I can't tell you how much marriage counseling I've done, and I'm like, dude, if you guys would just humble yourself a little bit, your marriage, it, it's usually the man's fault. I mean, women, you can say hey, amen on that one, right? I'm like, dude, if you just say you're sorry, come on, like humble yourself. But as guys, we don't want to, we don't want to humble ourselves. I, I see it with children raising kids. A little humility will go a long way. In your relationships at work, a little humility will go, go a long way. You know, for me, if I'm really honest, as a pastor, as a leader, as an American, as a man, oftentimes I think humility equals weakness. I think, oh, if I'm going to humble myself, I'm showing myself weak. I wouldn't want to humble myself before my wife. She'll think I'm weak. I wouldn't want to humble myself before my church. They would think I'm a weak leader. Like, we're, Americans, we're like this, right? We don't like the humility thing. It, it equates with, with weakness. Listen, humility is not weakness. You are not abandoning authority to show humility. As a matter of fact, you're stepping into authority. Oh, this is, this is going to be good. Okay, this is going to be good right here. I want you to get this. When you humble yourself, you're stepping out of your authority and you're stepping into his authority. Okay, listen. So if you have pride, what are you doing? You're stepping out of his authority and you're stepping into your authority. Friends, I want to step out of my authority in every area of my life. I want to humble myself so I can operate under his authority. The, the title of the message today is the key, the key to kingdom everything. The key to kingdom everything is humility. It's the key to the kingdom of God being unlocked over your life. The assemblies of God, which you are assemblies of God today, just because you're sitting in this building, you are AG, was born out of a revival in 1906. Out of 1906, there's a great revival. It's called the Sousa Street Revival. And out of that, the Pentecostal movement, the charismatic movement that we're experiencing today was, was born. Well, at the head of that revival was a man named William Seymour. And before his services, it was always noted that you would find William Seymour on his knees repenting before God, begging for God's forgiveness. Why? Because that revival was not going to be born out of his pride. It was going to be born out of his humility. There's many people that report William Seymour sitting on the corner of the stage with a box over his head during worship. Why? Because it wasn't about him. Friends, it is not about you. Turn to the person next to you and tell them, it's not about you, my friend. It's not about you. John 3.30, John puts it this way. He must increase and I must. He must increase in my life and I must decrease. Friends, the key to kingdom, everything is humility. It's the starting point. And friends, I want you to hear me today. When you come before an almighty God, the only thing you have to bring is humility. When you come before the alpha and omega, the beginning and the end, you have nothing of your own to bring except for humility and humbling yourself before God. It's the one thing you have to bring to the table. And in James chapter 4, verse 6, he starts with a huge statement. It's the thesis of this section and a theme throughout the entire Bible. It says this, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to who? The humble. He resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. So I'm up in the airplane above the Pacific Ocean, and sometimes when I'm, I, I get weird things in my mind when I'm prepping sermons, okay? And I had this, it's been in my office for probably... 10 years. I used it for a sermon a long time ago, and it's in the back of my bookshelf, and I hung on to it because I'm cheap, and if I want to use it again, I wanted it to be there, right? So I'm sitting there, and I, for some reason, this stupid thing, this ugly thing came to my mind, and, and I, I hope it, it helps you, but it was what was in my mind, so I want to share it with, with you. When we allow pride in our life, the, the pride, okay, the site's pride, the site is grace and the presence of God, available to you. When we allow pride to increase, what happens to the presence of God in our life? What happens to the grace of God? It decreases. So when you, when you and by the way, we all come to God like this. When, we, when you get saved, you're like this, right? A lot of pride and little grace, but, but how do you combat that? You start adding some, 
humility. You start adding some humility and all of a sudden grace starts to rise up in your life. The presence of God starts to rise up in your life and you combat that pride with humility. And you know what happens? That grace rises up and it begins to flow into your life. Why? Because the river of God will always flow to the lowest places. And when you make yourself low, you are saying, I'm here and I'm ready for the river of God to flow in my life in my life, the grace of God to flow. What is grace? It's getting you, you getting something you don't deserve. See, it is by grace you are saved, but it doesn't stop there. You know all those promises of God in the Bible? It is by grace you get those promises of God. You don't deserve any of them. It is the grace of God. You want blessings on your life? You don't deserve one blessing from God. They are poured out upon your life because of grace. You want the call of God on your life. You want gifts of God on your life. You want the anointing of God on your life. You don't earn it. You get it by humility. It is the grace of God poured out upon you. You're sitting here today and you're like, man, I'm so gifted. You are gifted because of grace. When I stand up here and I feel the anointing of God, I don't deserve the anointing of God on my life. It is by the grace of God that I receive the anointing of God. It is born out of of humility and a humble heart. The result of humility is the activation of grace in your, in your life. So we see the thesis for, for James here. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And now he starts to give us some instructions because my question would be, okay, James, how do I get humility then? How do I kill the pride in my life so I can skip, um, I can tilt the scales in, in my favor with God? And, and how do I position myself for grace, for grace to be poured out on me? And James is glad you asked because he's going to spend a few minutes telling you, okay? So if you got, if you take notes, grab your phone right now, get ready to take a few notes. I'm going to give you six things. Okay, how do you get humility in your life so grace can be poured poured out there it says this verse in verse seven therefore submit to god the number one thing you got to do is you got to submit it says therefore therefore because you want grace because you you want the the grace of god poured out on you because i know that god resists the proud and gives grace to the humble therefore i will submit to god that word submit, it's way harder for some of us than others, isn't it? Because some of you all sitting here today, I know you got a stubborn streak, okay? you got a stubborn streak in your life. My, my son, Jaron, who's 16, he's always been like this since he's a little kid. If I look at him, I give him a dirty look, he straightens up. Elsie, on the other hand, if I give her a dirty look, she gives me a dirty look right back, right? She's got her mom's stubborn streak in her. Isn't that true, like how we are with God? I mean... Anyone here, you watch wrestling when you were a kid, WWF, like there was Andre the Giant, right? There was Hulk Hogan, no, yeah, Hulk Hogan, right? Okay, so all of these guys, and you'd be watching in your room as a little kid, and they're just beating on each other, and they got to tap out, and you're watching just Andre the Giant beating on somebody, you're like, poor guy, tap out, tap out, you're going to die. Some of us, like, we're like that in our faith, aren't we? Everyone around us is saying, you've been fighting God for so long. Just tap out. Your life doesn't have to get any worse. You don't have to go further in the gutter. Just tap out. Just submit to God. You can't fight God forever. But we battle our stubbornness. Friends, humility, step one to getting some humility is tapping out. It's submitting. It's surrendering. It's giving him control. It's why we charismatics, we do, we do this, don't we? You know what this means? I'm tapping out, God. <laughs> I'm tapping out. I can't do this on my own. I surrender. We come to worship. I came in the back here today after an incredible service in golf, incredible service. Walked here in the back. A lot of people were like this, right? Because they're saying, I, I got to surrender to God. I need God. Others of you are fighting it because there's a stubborn streak in us, isn't there? In every one of our hearts to submit to God. If you're going to live a humble life, you've got to submit. Number two. Number two, therefore, because he gives grace to the humble, therefore, you've got to resist. Everyone say resist. Verse seven, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Oh, come on. This is good news right here. Resist the devil and guess what? He'll flee from you. You don't have to be the devil's puppet. You don't have to be his doormat any longer. There's a promise here for you. The devil will flee. Do you know what this is called? 
It's called authority. I just spent a week on a military base. Okay, my son is now an E3. So E1, E2, E3. He just became an E3. So he's going up in the, in the ranks in the military, but he's still scared to death of officers. So Ken, he would be scared to death of you now, okay? I, so we stopped by, um, I have a friend that's a chaplain in Okinawa now, and he's a, he's a military chaplain. All the chaplains are officers. So I hadn't seen this guy in years, so I'm like, I'm going to stop by his office. My son was with me. I said, hey, Judah, we're going to go in and see um, my friend. He's a chaplain. He goes, I'm not going in there. I'm like, why not? He goes, he's an officer. I'm not going in there. My hair is too long. I, I, I'll get yelled at, right? Do you know why? Because there is an authority there. When you walk in the room, he knew if I walk in that room, the, the, listen, the, the officer, right, Ken, the officer is not going to go, oh, excuse me, um, young man, oh, you're so nice. I, I, I love you so much. And I'm just asking you if you could go get your hair cut. The officer is not going to do that. He's going to say, kid. And my son's going to go, yes, sir. He's going to say, haircut now. And he's going to go get his haircut. Why? Because that officer has authority. Friends, listen, too many times we treat the devil like we have no authority. We're like, come on, devil, could you please, like, leave? I know you're tempting me, and could you please? I'm, I don't want to hurt your feelings, and I'm a nice guy, and I'm like, that's how we treat the devil. When all we got to do, friends, you've got authority. All you got to do is say, in the name of Jesus, be gone, and that thing's got to leave, friends. You have authority. You have authority over the enemy. Oh, oh this is good. Listen, you're going to like this. Luke chapter 10, verse 9, I have given you what? authority, tread on snakes and scorpions and over the power of the enemy. You have authority over the devil, but there is a condition in that that verse right there. It says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Not play around with the devil, allow the devil to come around, fall into the temptation a little bit, treat it weakly. It's not that big of a deal. I'm okay this time. No, resist the devil and then he will flee from you exercise the authority. Exercise it. You you don't have to ask him. You can command him. It's easy. The devil comes around. You say, in the name of Jesus, be gone. He's tempting you. You say, in the name of Jesus, be gone. Exercise your authority. Why is this important? Because if you don't resist the devil, you're going to embrace sin, and sin abides where pride abides. You're going to have a lot of pride in your life if you embrace sin in your life. So if you're going to be a person of humility, you have to be a person that resist the enemy. Number three, therefore, it's because he gives grace to the humble. Number, number three, you got to know. Know who? Verse eight, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. In marriage counseling, I've done marriage counseling with people that have had affairs. And if you talk to them and you start drilling and you get to the bottom of it, they'll say this. Why did it happen? Why did it happen? Why did it happen? You get all these layers and it comes down to this. We started growing apart. (laughs) We started feeling some distance in our marriage and it ended up in compromise. See, the more distance you get, someone hear me today, the more distance you get, you're going to end up in places you never thought possible. Draw near to God. You know, I'm concerned that we have created a Christianity that's all about rituals. It's about me punching the card, coming to church. It's about me paying my tithe. It's about me taking communion. Those are all good things. But that's not what it's about. I think while we're doing all this stuff, God is beckoning us. Come near to me. Come near to me. I want you near to me. I don't want you far doing rituals, thinking you're somehow going to please me. I want you near to my heart. And again, there's a promise. He will draw near to you, but there's a condition. Draw near to him. Draw near to him. Listen, it is hard to sin against him when you're in relationship with him. It's hard to sin when you're closer to him. It's hard to let pride overcome when your relationship with him is number one. Intimacy with God is the antiviral to pride. It's the anti-venom to the bite of the snake in your life. Humility flows from intimacy. Intimacy with God. Number four, therefore, because he resists the proud and gives grace to the humble, cleanse yourself. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Do you know what this is saying? It's really easy. It's saying wash your hands. How many know during the last couple years, we've learned a lot about washing your hands, haven't we? Uh, my wife is like a wash your hands Nazi. 
She's always like, wash your hands. You got to wash your hands. You wash your hands. And she carries the little tubes of stuff. She's like squirting it on my hands. And like, right, we've got them all over the church now. Like, and I have bacterial soaps all over the office and the house, right? Wash your hands. It's hard for me because I'm not a wash my hands guy. I don't wash my hands ever. As a matter of fact, I went to the bathroom on my way in and I didn't wash my hands. <laughs> I wouldn't do that to you. Do you know why? Because it would be appalling. It would be gross. And I respect you too much. But how many of you know we do that with God all the time, don't we? We do it with God all the time. We just kind of live whatever life and we don't care. They would have understood this because it was a ritual. It was symbolic as they prepared to go into the temple to worship. They would prepare to handle the sacrifice. They, would, they wouldn't take it casually. It would be intentional. They do it with care and they would wash their hands because I respect you to mu- too much to bring my mess into your life. It goes further, though. Well, cleanse your hands. And he says this in verse 8, purify your hearts, you double-minded. Number five, purify. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. That double-minded, that's important. That means you got one foot in and one foot out with God. You got one foot in the world and you got one foot in with, with God. And he says, you can't, you can't live like that. You got to purify your heart. You cannot be double-minded. It goes beyond just washing your hands to a heart issue. You got to deal with your attitude and your motives and your thoughts. The apostle Paul says to take every thought captive, to get the junk out of your life. Friends, the Christian walk is work. And it takes you working, winning the battle between your ears. Why? Because garbage in, garbage what? Garbage out in your life. David put it this way, search me, O God, if there's any offensive way in me, reveal it. We've got to continuously be dealing with the heart issues in our life, the pull of the world, the pollution of the world. Well, how do we do that? James tells us in number six. Therefore, therefore, because he he resists the proud and gives grace to the humble. Therefore, lament, mourn, weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. What's he talking about? He's talking about a life of repentance. That's number six, repent. Live a life of repentance, the key to a healthy Christian life. Recognize your failure. Grieve your failure. Turn from your failure. Friends, it is impossible for, dr- for pride to dwell in a repentant heart. I want you to hear me say that today. It's impossible for pride to dwell in a repentant heart. How many of you know we all deal with pride, don't we? It's hard for that to dwell when you live a life of repentance. I'm 20 years in ministry now, pastor's kid, all these things that I could, I could say, oh, I do this, I do that. Do you know what I did this morning? I came in here, I turned on the lights, plugged in the coffee so you'd have coffee, and then turned on the heaters, came up here, you're welcome, and then I got on my knees, and you know what I did? I said, God... I'm such a failure. I'm such a broken person. I so desperately need you. Search my heart, God. There's nothing in me that is righteous, and I come to you broken. It's a life of repentance. And when you live a life of repentance, guess what? You can live a life of humility, and you can have grace flowing to your life, and you can live in your calling, and you can live in your anointing, and you can experience revival in your heart and in your mind and in your spirit. And then he ends in verse 10. He says, listen, submit, resist, know, cleanse, purify, repent. As a result, listen to what he says in verse 10, humble yourself. As a result, you'll be able to do that. Humble yourself. When you follow my instructions, you'll humble yourself before the Lord, and he will exalt you. He will exalt you. How many of you want to be exalted in the eyes of God? I I want to be exalted. I want him to exalt me. I want him to lift me up. I want to be positioned for that to happen. How am I positioned for God to exalt me? I humble myself. I like instructions. I like to do manuals. If I'm going to put something together, I'm going to read the instructions first. If I something breaks from my house, I'm going to get on the YouTube, and I'm going to YouTube mechanic. I can fix anything with YouTube, right? I like a simple guy like me. I like instructions. And James says, here's your instructions, and you'll have humility in your life. As you focus on these things, humility will result, and grace will be poured upon you, and I will exalt you. I will lift you up. Will you stand with me today? I want to be, have a life that is filled with humility. Do you know why? Because it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. But this mind being you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, did not consider it to be robbery, robbery to be equal with God, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant and coming in the likeness of men and being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself. 
He humbled himself. And then what happened? He became obedient to the point of death. He humbled himself even to death on the cross. Therefore, because he did that, God highly exalted him and gave him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, that is in heaven and those on earth and those under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. He humbled himself, friends. He humbled himself. And when Jesus decided, when Jesus humbled himself, guess what? Grace was poured out to him. God exalted him. It's a kingdom principle, friends. It's a kingdom principle. The lower you get, the higher you are in the kingdom. The least shall be the the greatest. The last shall be the first. And the river of God flows to the lowest places. Flows to the lowest places. I want to invite you all over this place to, if you would, just close your eyes and just lift your hands if you feel comfortable. And if you would say yes to this message, don't feel forced. I lift my hands today to say I submit. I humble myself today to you. The almighty God, the creator of all things, I have nothing to bring but my humility. It's the gateway to all things in the kingdom. It's the gateway to grace. Come on, if you guys get this, it's going to change everything for you. Everything will be different from this Sunday on if you can get this. Come on, your marriage is going to be different. Everything, your, your home is going to be different. Your relationship with God is going to be different. Everything's going to be different. Humility is the gateway. So, so this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to, I'm going to just to remind you because I need you to, if you don't forget to give on the way out, okay? We got our tithe. We got our thing in the back. So give on your way out. I trust you'll do that. If you haven't done it already and now i'm just going to open the altar that's going to be indefinite okay so we're going to open up the altar to you the altar is open at the front but also where you're at if you want to stay because god might want to move you in a different way it doesn't have to be forward maybe he's going to move in you right where you're at but i want there to be a spirit of humility come on as your hands are raised let there be a spirit of humility come on as we do that don't you feel the presence of god fill in this place presence of god when you feel like you've gotten what you need for the day, feel free to leave. No one's going to judge you for that. We're all in different places. But let God just fill you with his grace as you humble yourself in his presence today. So we do this song, come on, the altar's open. If you want to make your seat an altar, if you want to sit, if you want to stand, if you want to walk, whatever you want to do, come on, let's make this place a place of humility. It's not about me. I might as well sit in the corner with a box over my head. It's not about me, God. It's about you. I humble myself before you today. Do whatever. 
Do whatever you want to, Lord. I will make room for you. Do whatever you want to. Do whatever you want to. Shake up the ground of all my tradition. Break down the walls of all my religion. Your way is better. tradition break down the walls of all my religion your way is better your way is better shake up shake up the ground of all my tradition break down the walls of all my religion your way is better your way is better shake up the ground of all my tradition break
continue in the spirit of worship, I want to move us into a, a specific area of prayer that I feel like the Lord's leading me to. Um, hey, Jeremiah, could you come over here and help me out? Um, this has only happened to me once before, so I, this is the second time this has happened to me in my ministry years, okay? And um, so it's going to take a little bit of vulnerability for me, and it's going to take a little bit of vulnerability for you, okay? So that's the deal we had at the very beginning. So last night, I didn't sleep even one minute all night. Did not sleep one minute. I was awake all night. Call it time change, jet lag. I don't know what it was. I was sleeping fine. I didn't, I watched, I sat and watched my fan go around and try to wake Sean up a few times to tell her, okay? I'm not sleeping, right? And in the midst of that, I got, I was getting anxious. I'm not gonna be able to preach. I'm not gonna be able to do tomorrow. What am I gonna do? And then a little bit like down, like, man, I can't, what am I going to do? I'll never sleep again. And so anxiety and depression and all these things started to kind of flood over me as I couldn't sleep. So I'm asking God, this never happens to me ever. This is the first time. I'm standing over here and the Lord's saying there's purpose in that because there's people here today that are struggling with anxiety, struggling with depression, and it's stealing sleep from them. Today I want to break it over their lives. I want to break it. Okay, he want, he. If you put me through that to break it in your life, that's fine, okay? Maybe it was just jet lag and God's using it, but he wants to break it in your life. That's what he's speaking to me. And so so we're going to, I'm, I'm going to go over there. And if you're dealing, maybe it's not to that extent that you're up all night, but you're dealing with sleeplessness, depression, anxiety. That's a lot after this, the pandemic and everything that people are dealing with. We want to break it today in the name of Jesus. Do you believe that Jesus can break that? Can I hear an amen? He wants to break it. So whatever it is level in your life, today he's going to break that in the name of Jesus. So you come on over here. We're going to pray for you. We're going to continue to worship. Again, when you're done, you're done. We're going to continue to worship. But don't let the moment pass because this could be your moment of freedom. You may never have to go back to it again, or you may go back to it again. It's really up to you. It's a crossroad. It's a promise with a condition. So I want to invite you. Come on out. We're going to be over here. Step out of your chair if you need prayer for that today.
mountain high or valley low, I sing out, remind my soul that I am yours, I am forever yours. Love came down, love came down and rescued me. schedule for you, God. We remove our agenda to make room for the King. Oh, Jesus, you're everything. Take 
teach me to not be rushed off to the next thing. You're the air we breathe. You're the song we sing. You're everything. You're my everything. Come and be my everything, Jesus. Come and be my everything.
Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else. Nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else will do. I just want you. Nothing else, nothing else, nothing else. Whatever you want to, I will make 
Thank you.